Greg and Maureen, come on up and join us. I understand that Ruth is in it, but this, <laughs> this message is not just our Ruth series. It's surviving the holidays with family. That's right. Which, who knows what your stories are from Thursday and Friday and over the weekend, but we always have fun family stories. That's the great part of the holidays. And I just want to thank Greg Thatcher. If you haven't had a chance to meet Greg, Greg serves on our worship steering team, and he is a tremendous blessing. But... Sorry, I'm biased. I know. Because Maureen. She's way better. Maureen serves on the best steering team. Right, Anna? <laughs> Maureen serves on the kids' steering team. And we love this. Bo this family is such an integral part of our church. So we're excited to hear what God's put on your heart for today. Thank you. All right. Hey, welcome. So you survived Thanksgiving and Black Friday and Small Business Saturday and mega football games. I don't want to know the Seahawks. Who's back there listening on their iPad? Who's, are you, Kelly, get the earpiece out. He's listening to the Seahawks game. I don't want to know the Seahawks game score. Okay, Huskies lost yesterday. Or sorry, day before yesterday. Yeah, I know. Uh, so you survived all that. That's good. I'm glad you're here this morning. Maureen and I are going to uh, share a little bit with you this morning. This is uh, maybe... Power, unless you got power. There you go, Grandpa. Okay, thank you, Grandpa. <laughs> this is placing the lonely in families, or families put the fun in holiday dysfunction. <laughs> it's a picture of my brother Chris a few years ago. Just kidding. Sorry, Dad. Uh, <laughs> just thought we'd share a few things with you this morning about. Uh, Thanksgiving and uh, where we could take ourselves and our friends and our family during the holiday season now that we have survived Thanksgiving. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Does anybody have a, a horror story about their Thanksgiving this year or the year past? I was reading about one uh, in Bon Appetit that says this lady asked her butcher to make a kosher turkey for her. So she went to pick it up, and it was all wrapped up, and a few hours before the guest got there, she was going to put it in the oven. She unwrapped it, and it all had feathers on it still. She called the butcher, and he said, lady, I thought you knew what you were in for, asking for a kosher bird. So <laughs> there's a whole slew of those if you want, but if you had a bad Thanksgiving, I'm really sorry, but we had a pretty good Thanksgiving. I think we did. So we're going to talk about the holidays and uh, placing, how God places the lonely in families. I'm going to ask John Woodbury to uh, pray for us this morning. If we could get the microphone back there for John. He's promised not to preach while he prays, but that's okay with me. So I do the same thing. John? Is it on? Is it on? Uh, a couple months ago, I was given this prayer, a po little poem, really, for this church. And I knew that it had to be at the right time. And I suggest that this is that time. Our prayer is, Lord, let your word go forth, let your story be told, let your truth be known, yes. and let your love be shown. And we thank you, Lord, thank you, that that will happen here. And I also lift up <clears throat> North Shore Christian Church, which is the home church of my brother and the Lord Dave Rose, who died this week. And mm. I pray for that church. They preach the gospel there, and I thank you for their support for he and his family. I ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, John. I should let you in on a new product on the market that we recently discovered. It's going to make every holiday much more enjoyable for everyone. Are you sick and tired of your family? Do holiday get-togethers seem unbearable? Then you need the Family Survival Kit. New from the makers of Date Be Gone and Rent-A-Kid, it's the Family Survival Kit. Filled with tons of family neutralizing goodness. Like the criticism canceling headphones. Harsh words go in, but compliments come out. Why can't you be more like your sister? She's always been here when I am so proud. You are perfect just the way you are. I love you. Creeped out by over affection to dance? Not anymore with Family Off. Specially formulated to repel unwanted affection. <gasps> now, how much would you pay? Never be asked for money again with the Mooch Whistle. It sends out a high-pitched sound that only Mooches can hear. They'll be too confused to ask for anything. Undisciplined children are no problem at all with sleepy time brat darts. 
Just lift, aim, and blow for a whole 24 hours of brat free living. But wait, there's more. Unsure of what to say to emotionally unavailable family members? Then let an expert say it for you with Dr. Phil in a can. Are you avoiding reality? Do you resent your children? Do you realize that this is a big problem? You can't change what you don't acknowledge. Thanks, Dr. Phil. If all else fails, use our patented nuclear family love grenade. Just pull the pin, toss it in, and let nitrous oxide put the fun back in dysfunction. So call this number and get your family survival kit today. Just three easy payments of $19.95. Order today and get the tongue cozy absolutely free. I can't taste a thing. So order yours today. Supplies limited price subject to change. Love grenade not legal in Utah, Hawaii, and California. Not responsible for any damage or liability associated with improper use of products. May not work on Germans, accountants, or people who are sticklers for spelling. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You see that burnt turkey and everything? what it is about families and holidays that seems to evoke such strong feelings in people. I don't know about you, but around uh, uh, my office, if, if you just say those two things, oh, it's almost the holiday, oh, it's families, uh. <laughs> You know, Greg and I have a pretty normal family. <laughs> no. I don't say average, because I don't think that I really know that many average people. But I have to say, Christmas is my favorite time of the year. It is my favorite. I love everything about Christmas. I love the songs. I love the decoration. I love the warm-up. I love the smells. I love the cooking. I love everything about it. it it's, it's just my, my most favorite time during the year. You know, when I was growing up, um, I have five siblings, and so all five of us with my parents would open gifts on Christmas Eve, and uh, it, it was great. Now all of my siblings... Um, have children and they're all married and my folks are gone. Oh, am I not on? Sorry. Who wants to come check this? Now you're on. Mm. Boy, howdy am I on. Oh, I thought you were, <laughs> thought you were electric. Oh, yeah. Hi. I've never been that loud in my whole life. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> He's probably saying, yeah, that that's great. Um, all, all of my family, uh, all my siblings are, are married. And so if we all got together, all of my brothers and sisters, all of our kids and their kids, there would be 57 of us. And we still do that. We still get together. Not everybody shows up, but I'm telling you, it is a party. For me, that's, I, I love that part of it. I love parties. So um, <clears throat> I, I would say that it's the highlight of the year. And, you know, we do like what everybody else does. We eat. Uh, we sing, we laugh, we play, we pray, we read the Bible story while the kids are going, tick-tock, got presents to open, come on. <clears throat> I, I would say that it's so much more than that, though. I, in, for me, it's like being wrapped up in something really warm and wonderful. For me, Christmas was about uh, surprises. Uh, Chris was about three years old, my younger brother Chris, and... Uh, I remember the four of us watching him eat a Christmas tree ornament <laughs> and seeing what was going to happen next. Uh, in 1970, my dad took me aside and he said, son, it's going to be a lean Christmas. I want you to know that. It's going to be a lean Christmas. I don't want you to expect too much. I guess I should have lowered my expectations even more as I got one shirt and some used underwear from Goodwill. Now, I knew it was used because it had someone else's name printed on the inside. <laughs> now, while my brothers and I got the shirt and the underwear, my sisters got new bicycles. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where the lean part came in for them. What I really like, besides kind of my family, is being around my friends and their families as well to see their different reactions. And those really interested me to see those those things in their families. Well, you know, I said that this has always been, and it still is, my very favorite time during the year. Um, I would say, though, that in the last few years, um, our Christmases have been tough. You know, families going through hard things, rough things, um, hurts, um, relationship pain, um, lots of stuff, hard stuff. People missing too. Yeah. 
You know, uh, I'm not sure I can even explain how, how that feels, but last year, uh, <laughs> only grandparents will, will truly understand this last year, not only were our, all of our children gone, but all of our grandchildren were gone for both of the big holidays, for both Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, I think that I had some unmet or unrealistic expectations because that was not my expectation of what my Christmas was going to be about. Um, you know, I would say until the last few years, I've never had a bad Christmas, really. I, I don't think I could ever remember that. Um, I was overseas for a couple of years in the Navy, and I was homesick. Uh, I was really homesick, but it wasn't bad. I would say the only odd thing, and Justine, I'm sorry, I would say the weirdest thing about Christmas in Australia was 120 degrees in the <laughs> desert on Christmas Day. I, I couldn't quite get my head wrapped around. I mean, you know, we, we lowered the blinds, we turned the air conditioning up so that it, you know, we pretended it was cold. <clears throat> With an artificial tree, I bet, too. Of course. There are no real trees like that in Australia. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I think I've heard about empty nesters. I know this sounds foolish. I never thought it would happen to me. I, I know, I know. I mean, they grow up and they go away, but I, I really didn't have any expectation that our kids would actually leave, be gone. And, you know, um, they were gone. The grandkids were gone. The kids are gone. And we really couldn't say anything about it <laughs> because, didn't, you know, they were all together, and, and we had raised them to choose one another. I don't think we ever met not choose us, too, but <laughs> we, we wanted them. We wanted them to be independent. And so we, we couldn't afford They all were in Spokane last year, and, and we were here. Uh, I actually like my birthday better than Christmas because the focus is on me. <laughs> oh, <God>. But <laughs> I, I do look forward to Christmas. Um, I've, I've had a few tough Christmases in my life, not very many, but the Christmas before I came to faith, I was contemplating suicide. And in the middle of contemplating that dumb act, I got a phone call from my best friend. Uh, who has, he and I have just recently reconnected. That's another story. But he called me in the middle of that, and he said, hey, let's go out. I got a bonus. Let's go buy Christmas presents. Let's go to dinner. Let's have a blast. And we did. And he kept asking me, who, who, what are you going to buy for so-and-so? What are you going to buy for her? What are you going to buy for him? What about their parents? What about his? And I said, Ken, I don't have that much money. He said, here, here's 200 bucks. He said, you don't have to pay me back. Let's go and make Christmas something for other people. And it began to dawn on me that night that the holidays were really about other people and showing the love that we had for others and giving them something tangible in return. The next year, I had come to faith, and I'm telling you, things were just so totally different. It was all, it was all Jesus. I understood all the carols. I understood. And I'd been a Catholic before, so I understood those things. But now the reality of knowing Jesus you could see it in the pictures that people took of me that Christmas. I was jazzed, man. I was pumped. And I think people got, probably got more of that Christmas than the Christmas before. But I began to understand it. You know, I've had some rough times with my family as well. I'm a bit of an antagonist because that's my birthright as a firstborn. Right, Chris? Okay. And I look for other families to be part of my own experience and my own family. There was something curious about other families and how they celebrated Christmas. I like being with my family, but I like being with other families as well. And even some of my personal traditions, don't tell anybody this, but some of my personal traditions, like listening to the Carpenter's Christmas album. Yeah, I know, I know. For somebody that loves Grand Funk Railroad, I don't think my father ever knew that I was a closet Carpenter's fan. But like the Carpenter's Christmas album, I, that kind of crept into my Christmas celebration time. And things like that that I saw other people doing, you know, I really, that really got me. It was amazing to me how other people celebrated Christmas, not just my own family. Well, you know, given the last few years, I'm not quite sure um, how to approach um, Christmas this year. And maybe you had a phenomenal time at Thanksgiving. We actually had a really pretty good time. We still, we're missing a few, but still, we had a good time. Um, but, you know, I don't want to just survive Christmas. As funny as that um, video is, I have no desire just to survive it. I don't want to let a bomb go off. And <laughs> Well, I don't know, nitrous oxide might be fun at Christmas, but uh, <laughs> I really want it to be amazing. I, I want it to be fabulous again. I want it to be thrilling. 
But you know what? Probably truthfully, I just don't want it to be disappointing. There was probably a time where I would have said that if I just had Maureen, I didn't need anything else. That sounds really romantic, but you know, it's actually pretty unhealthy. <laughs> I'd like to say that having our kids and grandchildren gone at Christmas was only a big deal to Maureen, but it, it, that would be a lie. There was real emptiness there. And though we really had a great time with our family and, and with her family, which is really my family, it was, seemed much less enjoyable and much less important and much less everything than it could have been if the kids and the grandkids were been there. You know, maybe you found yourself in some of these places. Some point in your life that you're not looking forward to Christmas, times with family, not sure how to act, whether to avoid the whole deal and just stay at home and watch TV. I'm sure that there's a basketball or football game or a soccer game or a badminton match somewhere. <laughs> Avoidance therapy. That's what my counselor calls it. Some situ Yes, I do go to a counselor, and I am okay. The medication doesn't seem to have any ill effects <laughs> whatsoever. Some situations of a few years ago had me avoid my side of the family and some of the Christmases there. And Dad, for that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't go to the Lord in prayer and ask him what our role should be. And I'm sorry that I withdrew. And if I haven't told you before, thank you for providing for us and giving us so many great Christmas memories. Even going to Portland like... 89 years in a row or whatever it was to see your family. I, I really appreciate all that you did for us at Christmas. Thank you. You know, you might feel like uh, when you get together with family, it's great. Or maybe when you get together with your family uh, at holidays, it doesn't just quite deliver the way you think it should. I don't know about you, but have you noticed the commercials at Christmas? Uh, really, if I say Folgers Coffee, how many of you know the Folgers Coffee commercial? I still cry every single time I see that stupid commercial. And it, I mean, I think it came on 20 years ago. For those of you that don't remember or aren't old enough to remember commercials from, well, you know, the 40. dark ages. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a snowy day for people in the Northwest. You know, the snow means Christmas, maybe sometimes, but I'd prefer that to the, uh, to the rain. Um, you know, a young man comes home. You know, he's bundled up. He sneaks into the house. He's got presents. His little sister wakes up. She comes downstairs, and he tells her to be quiet. He's got presents. I'm, did I say he's got presents? He's a, in college, and he's got presents and no laundry. Well, <laughs> Unlike Drew. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, he, uh, he says, uh, he, he motions her to be quiet, and then he makes coffee. And mom and dad wake up to the smell of coffee and come, come down the stairs. Peter, you're here with presents. <laughs> Maybe we could adopt Peter. Um, I think we've done that a few times. How about all the Christmas classic movies? It's a Wonderful Life. It is. It's a Wonderful Week or a Month when that movie comes on. Holiday Inn, Miracle on 34th Street, A Christmas Carol. Here's one of Maureen's favorites, A Christmas Story. Christmas Vacation, Home Alone. Here's another one. Adam loves this one. Four Christmases. You seen that one? Don't. <laughs> Family man. Or even Scrooge. By the way, Maureen loves sappy, I mean happy endings. Well, excuse me. <laughs> you know, I don't know if there's any hope for an American entirely brainwashed by television. I, I don't know about you, but if you don't have this unrealistic, perfect family, perfect family, I uh, highly unlikely you're going to have the great Christmas that, you know, that you see on television. Seems like, um, I don't know about you, but I mean, I am so emotional at Christmas. I look at the, all of the, everything that's on, and I love the, the, the Christmas uh, programs, all of it. I will watch a Charlie Brown Christmas. I will cry at the end. I always do. I, I cry at everything, and I like it. <laughs> I think, though, that sometimes I am lonely for something that I can't even identify. Th there's a something, you know, some, some expectation I have for Christmas that I don't think I could put it into words. But I do. I feel like I'm lonely for something I can't even define. And then I think about, what about broken families? What about kids who have to celebrate Christmas between multiple sets of parents? 
What about families who've lost someone since last Christmas? What about folks who are single and, and have one, maybe two days off to cram all their fun in for Christmas? There are a lot of folks out there that might be feeling much like um, I do. What about uh, maybe there's a family that has a prodigal child, won't be home this Christmas, probably not going to show up. I think a lot of us have some unmet or unrealistic expectations about Christmas. That brings up a good point, too. Should someone else's ideal or dream about Christmas dictate to us what ours is to be? Selah, I didn't lose my place. Are, are we letting someone else tell us what, what the dream, the ideal is? Because some of the best memories I have of Christmas are with family. Some of the worst memories I have about Christmas are with family. What does the idea of, why is it that the idea of family draws us in, but the reality of family is so difficult? Let's watch this clip from Home Alone. Can you lower the mic? That's my granddaughter up there, the little red-haired girl. She's about your age. You know her? No. You live next to me, don't you? You can say hello when you see me. You don't have to be afraid. There's a lot of things going around about me, but none of it's true. Okay? You been a good boy this year? I think so. You swear to it? No. <laughs> yeah, I had a feeling. Well, this is the place to be. You're feeling bad about yourself. It is? I think so. Are you feeling bad about yourself? No. <laughs> I'm in kind of a pain lately. I said some things I shouldn't have. I really haven't been too good this year. Yeah. I'm kind of upset about it because I really like my family. Even though sometimes I say I don't. Sometimes I even think I don't. Do you get that? I think so. How you feel about your family is a complicated thing. Especially with an older brother. Deep down, you always love them. But you can forget that you love them. And you can hurt them and they can hurt you. And that's not just because you're young. You want to know the real reason why I'm here right now? Sure. I came to hear my granddaughter sing. And I can't come and hear her tonight. You have plans? No. I'm not welcome. 
At church? Oh, you're always welcome at church. I'm not welcome with my son. Years back, before you and your family moved on the block, I had an argument with my son. How old is he? Well, he's grown up. We lost our tempers. And I said I didn't care to see him anymore. He said the same. We haven't spoken to each other since. If you miss him, why don't you call him? I'm afraid if I call him, he won't talk to me. How do you know? I don't know. I'm just afraid he won't. No offense, but aren't you a little old to be afraid? You can be a little old for a lot of things. You're never too old to be afraid. That's true. I've always been afraid of our basement. It's dark, there's weird stuff down there, and it smells funny, that sort of thing. It's bothered me for years. The basements are like that. Then I made myself go down there to do some laundry, and I found out it's not so bad. All this time I've been worrying about it, but if you turn on the lights, it's no big deal. What's your point? My point is you should call your son. What if he won't talk to me? At least you'll know. Then you can stop worrying about it, and he won't have to be afraid anymore. I don't care how mad I was, I talked to my dad, especially around the holidays. I don't know. Just give it a shot, for your granddaughter anyway. I'm sure she misses you, and the presents. <laughs> I sent her a check. Wish my grandparents said that. They always send me clothes. Last year I got a sweater with a big bird knitted on it. Oh, that's nice. Not for a guy in the second grade. You can get beat up for wearing something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have a friend who got nailed because there was a room where he wore dinosaur pajamas. You better run along home where you belong. You think about what I said, all right? Okay. It's nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. What about you? Me? Yeah, you and your son. We'll see what happens. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And Kevin goes home to the battle. <laughs> Isn't that a great clip? I mean, it just kind of rings in Christmas to see that. You're always welcome in church. And you know what the old man's name was, don't you? Marley? <laughs> Scrooge and Marley? I know some of you have never read A Christmas Carol. <laughs> Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6 says this. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, this is God, whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. God places the lonely in families. So it sounds like he sets a smack dab into what is ailing us. God sets the lonely in families. You know, I checked out the dictionary because I thought, I'm not sure that I always... Uh, would understand, I guess, what all the words mean in, in just in that little piece of scripture. So I think that, yeah, we've got it. So God sets the lonely in families. He places, he anchors, he embeds, he inserts, plants. I like that. He plops, he plunks. <laughs> uh, the lonely. Well, you might not feel like you're lonely, but how about the abandoned, the alone, the deserted, the destitute, the dysfunctional, down, empty, estranged? The homeless, isolated, lonesome, outcast, reclusive, rejected, renounced, secluded, single, solitary, uncherished, unsocial, or withdrawn. And he puts us in families, in a tribe, in a system, in a dynasty, <laughs> in a clan, part of a brood. We become heirs in a lineage, in relationship with people. I don't know about you, but I think that there is some part of every single person that can fit into that description of lonely. But God loves us. He knows us. He wants great things for us. So he sets us in families. 
Ephesians 1, 3 to 6 says, Even before he made the world, God loved us. And he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. John 15 says, You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love one another. He chose us. A few weeks ago, Pastor Kurt was talking about um, Ruth and Naomi. Naomi was heading back to her family after her husbands and sons were all dead. That sounds kind of bad. Uh, She told her daughters in law to go back to their families. I have to read this, otherwise I won't get all of it. Uh, Ruth 1, 16 to 21 says, Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and be buried. doesn't sound like she had great hope for a long life herself. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi, the women said? Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? I would say that Naomi might have had some um, (coughs) unmet expectations. But Ruth chose Naomi. She loved her. She didn't want to go back to her own family. She'd been grafted into Naomi's family. I think it was kind of probably pretty bleak. Two women... They knowingly chose to go back to a place of family, but they didn't know anything about the family. So they didn't really have any confidence, only hope. Remember that they were not only broken, they were widowed, they were bankrupt. Every time I hear that story about Naomi, I'm struck by the fact that she changed her name to Mara, which means bitter. In case you didn't know, my name, the root of my name is Mara, bitter. I am not bitter. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. Craig and I heard a teaching a few years back about uh, incense in the tabernacle and about the fact that there are uh, about 13, I guess, different uh, things, that herbs and stuff that get ground up to make incense. The most interesting thing about that to me was that there's a, uh, an herb called, I believe it's galbanum. Galbanum, I think so. Ask, you can ask Will about that one. He'd know. I will. I will ask Will. Will? No. Um, it's a weird gummy substance. But its definitive characteristic is that it's very bitter. And when it's ground in with a mortar and pestle, um, when it's crushed, it makes the incense sweeter and stronger. Without it, it doesn't work. So bitter is, um, is a major component. Wow. Thinking about Christmas this year, or even about your family, do you wonder why he has set you in the family that you're in? It's entirely possible that you are the ingredient that God has added to sweeten and strengthen your family. I'm not trying to say you're bitter. I'm just saying (laughs) you might be the ingredient. We're not only part of a biological family. I am part of Harry and Ruby Thatcher's family. I'm part of Maureen's family. There's this story at uh, Christmas when Maureen was gone for the first year... No, not, not here. Not, not, not appropriate. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's really funny. It's no, no vodka stories. Okay. <laughs> I was gone. Well, I'll tell you another one then. I fooled my parents one year. They didn't know that it was their son dressed as Santa Claus standing at their front door. And I barged in, and for 10 minutes, they were trying to figure out who in the world that person was. That was fun. Our little, our little family, little Thatcher's kids and grandkids are another family. I'm a musician. That's a whole other dysfunctional family. <laughs> Musicians are temperamental. You know that. They're half temper and half mental. <laughs> uh, kudos to the Iwasaki family. I'm a UW Husky fam. I'm sure that they're going to like throw things at me right now <laughs> since we lost this weekend and Oregon and Washington State beat them. I'm still a UW Husky family person. And thank you. And wow, I say this with all sincerity and 
being very genuine that we're part of a great Lake Sam family. This genuine family of believers. What family has the Lord placed you into? Or this Christmas, what if you gave yourself permission to let go of the unrealistic expectations you might have of, of what Christmas is supposed to be? Um, embracing who you are and where you are, the family you're in, and choose joy. Now, I will say that the only reason I put this in uh, is because Greg said, oh, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> when I say choose joy, I, I mean choose to show it, to give it. Um, give people your happy face. Smile at people. It, it is really so compelling. I, I mean, strangers kind of think you might be kind of creepy, but still, you know, at Christmas time, people, um, they allow that. They, they allow you to be a little bit kinder and nicer. Um, count as gifts the blessings you've already received. In this season of gift giving, all that pulls and tugs on our hearts, the movies, the commercials. Remember the good gifts that God's already given us. You know, you're alive. You're right here today. You're right here in this moment. You've got air in your lungs. Uh, you have some family, some, I mean, whether you're part of family here, part of family elsewhere. Um, we have much. We have so much. You know, all that it means for us to be fully human, fully alive. But above all, I think we need to remember that the gift of the word made flesh was sent to us to save us, to heal us, to bring us joy bring us back to God's place in his family. You know, we could keep alert to see if we could make other people's um, days just a little bit better. And you don't have to wrap that. You don't have to stand in line for that. You just have to watch for it. Just for this Christmas season, because it might be almost impossible for some people, and it might be impossible for me, but just for this Christmas season, forget how to criticize. Just forget. Forget how to do that. Um, I will tell you that Lake Sam I have had so many opportunities uh, where I have said something to someone and uh, they've just washed over me with grace. So let grace be the first thing that you say instead of criticism. I think that's what we all want. Charles Dickens, who wrote Christmas Carol, I try to read that every year at Christmas. He said this, I've always thought of Christmas time when it came around as a good time a kind, forgiving, charitable time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem, by agreeing silently together, to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they were really fellow passengers to the grave, not, one, not another race of creatures <coughs> bound on other journeys. Let me dare you to empty your pockets at a Salvation Army kettle. Have you done it? Salvation Army is one of the few organizations that gives about 99% of what they take in at Christmas during the holidays and put it directly towards the needs of other people. I dare you. How different Christmas would be if we saw our families as a planned community designed so that we'll grow that we're appreciated, that we become stronger, stronger inside, stronger in courage, stronger in love, stronger in innovation. You know, I heard this the other day about the workplace. Now, try to apply this to the family, that in, uh, that, that in the workplace, only 10% of the employees ever thank their coworkers for anything, much less their boss. Imagine if we said thank you and please and all the regular normal things of etiquette in our families. What a gift that would be. That would be a starting point at least. Making ourselves as a gift to others is exactly what God did for us. Even before we were ever, or it became a thought in our head to be thankful to him for who he is or what he did for us. And he is the everlasting gift. Jesus, his own precious son, God gave us Jesus. And he chose us. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Family Man, but Nicolas Cage plays a very highly successful, very rich and powerful single businessman. He's given a glimpse. Don Keto plays kind of a semi-angel. He gives him a glimpse of what might have been in that one morning he wakes up as a husband in a real family, and he's a real father. 
Family holds so many things for him that he didn't realize he could be precious and part of a family. He then awakens to what he let get away, his family, because now that's where his heart resides. He tries to convince Tia Leone, who is his wife during the family glimpse, that they can be together and be a real family. Let's watch the clip from Family Man. And you, you're a nonprofit lawyer. That's right. You're completely nonprofit. But that doesn't seem to bother you. And we're in love. After 13 years of marriage, we're still unbelievably in love. You won't even let me touch you till I've said it. I sing to you. Not all the time, but, but definitely on special occasions. You know, we've, we've dealt with our share of surprises and, and, and made a lot of sacrifices, but we stayed together. You see, you're a better person than I am. And it made me a better person to be around you. I don't know, maybe, maybe it was all just a dream. Maybe I, I went to bed one lonely night in December and I, I imagined it all, but I swear, nothing's ever felt more real. And if you get on that plane right now, it'll disappear forever. I know we could both go on with our lives and we'd both be fine. But I've seen what we could be like together. And I choose us. Please, Kate. One cup of coffee. You can always go to Paris. Just please. Not tonight. Okay, Jack. I choose us. He said 13 years, right? We had 35 years. I can say the same thing Jack Campbell just said. You're a better person than I am. <laughs> yeah, you guys know that already, right? <laughs> yeah, you knew that already. Boy, Greg, talk about the better half. I choose us. God chose us long before we ever chose him. Galatians 4 says this, but when the time arrived that was set by God the Father, God sent his son, born among us of a woman, born under the conditions of the law, so that he might redeem those of us who have been kidnapped by the law. Thus we have been set free to experience our rightful heritage. You can tell for sure that you are now fully adopted as his own children, because God has sent the spirit of his son into our lives, crying out, Papa, Father. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave, but a child? And if you're a child, you're also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. Christ was born at the right time, and we were born for such a time as this. Do we dare to be a gift to others as Jesus was for us, is for us. The most basic of commandments is to love God with all that we are and to love our neighbor as ourselves and to even love our enemies. Jesus put that on there too. You know, it's two sides of the same coin. Love God, love others. There is such a need for love at this time of the year, well, throughout the year. The love of the heart, the real agape love with which God loved us the love that Will, when he spoke a few weeks ago, talked about the love, the commitment, the adoration, the, the connection that was between Ruth and Naomi. Imagine if we dropped expectations be, became his gift to others. Let's lose ourselves in the joy and the love of God. It's all around us. It's in us. <laughs> I mean, God lays it down to us every day he puts it in front of us. 
Can you imagine what our world would be like if we did just that much? To live in the love and joy and give others that unexpected Christmas gift. Right here at Lake Sam, we're his family. I see it every time I'm here, and even when I'm not here, when I communicate with the worship steering team. We're his family. And there's a place, an important role for you here. Dads, moms, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, shirt tail relatives, great family friends. It's possible for the lonely and the displaced and the hurt, the wounded, the orphans and the widows to be part of this family, God's family. Jesus came to put us in God's family. Jesus himself was born into an earthly family. Imagine all that surrounded that and that surrounded Jesus during his life being born into this earthly family. We are and can function as his family. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but we can function as his family. And there's an important place for you. God's indescribable gift to us is Jesus. Because of his life, because of his death, because of his resurrection power, he places us in this, his family, his church. Won't you join us? He's already made a place for you. He's already made a place for you. Let's pray. And God, what a privilege it is to be in your family. And Lord, more than just what you did for us, like for me as an individual, you've done for every person who names the name of Christ. And we're in your family. We've been made acceptable in the beloved, in the beloved family and in your beloved son, Jesus. We don't want to take that for granted, not for a minute, Lord. You set my lonely heart in a family, the family of God. Lord, thank you that it pleased you that I was Ruby and Harry's child, their firstborn. But Lord, thank you that it pleased you that you knew me and you called me and you called Maureen, and you called our kids, and Lord, this great family here at Lake Sam that we get to be part of. Would you reach down and take the two cups that are in front of you there? This shows that we're in God's family. We take the one cup with the bread and we break it. Our lives were broken. Our lives were broken. And all that we did in ourselves could not put us back together again. But because of Jesus, because he suffered and died, raised again, and he's coming again, we have become whole. Let's take the bread together. And the precious blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It was as white as snow. Sing that again. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Lord, we do this in memory of you and that we will, Lord, have this supper again, Lord, with you and your kingdom. And Lord, we look forward to the family of God being together 
And Lord, not being lonely anymore, but Father, together with those that have loved you and gone before us, and Lord, everyone that you will call. Father, we bless you and we thank you to be part of your family. Let's take the cup together. Can I have the ushers come forward? Thank you, Maureen. Thanks so much. I love, this is the best, best time I've ever had doing a message. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that our gifts be liberal. And Lord, you love a hilarious giver. You love those who give to you with you in mind and your people in mind, your family in mind. Multiply the gifts so that you're blessed, especially during this time of the year. In Jesus' name, amen.